If you think about what a composer does when he is about to compose music, um, a composer will start with a melody, and I think most of us are probably used to that as an assumption. But at that point, if, if you're a composer, you have two different options. Uh, the next thing you do, after you've got that beautiful melody, you can put some chords underneath. And this is what I think the vast majority of us would just assume is the natural thing to do with music. You've got a melody, let's put some chords underneath. These chords are what we would oftentimes call harmony. Now, it, before about the year 1750, let's say, in round numbers, uh, before about the year 1750, composers had a very different idea, and, and not even composers, just every musician, folk musician, any kind of musician, would have a different assumption about what the next thing you do is after you've got that melody. So I've got a, a melody, what do I do now? I'm gonna add another melody and I'm gonna make that melody work with the first melody. They're gonna be different melodies. I don't want them to be too similar, because that will be boring, but I want them to be different enough and yet sound good together. And then I, after I'm done with that second melody and I've made sure they sound good together, I might add a, a third melody and a fourth and a fifth. And the results of the kind of miracle of all of those melodies being different and yet despite that difference sounding good together, that is what uh, a pre-modern world would mean by the word harmony. It's that difference that has been reconciled. Um, a form, an old formulation is uh, discordia concors, uh, or sometimes concordia discourse, and that is to say concordant dissonance, discordant consonance. Um, the idea being that you have got things that sound different from one another, and yet that difference ends up sounding wonderful. Um, that is an approach to composition which uh, becomes called in uh, the West, counterpoint. Uh, and, and counterpoint is a, a huge focus uh, of mine, and it's, it's a lens through which you can see the entire history of uh, sacred liturgical music. Uh, and that is that, that there's something about uh, the Christian faith that really finds in counterpoint a beautiful picture of uh, the harmony of the different parts of the created order. Uh, it finds in uh, counterpoint a beautiful parable of the harmony of the body of Christ, the different functions of the members all being under one thing. Um, harmony is uh, originally, of course, a Greek term, uh, with harmonia, which is used to describe uh, really this kind of baffling heterogeneity in the world. Uh, the world is full of different things. It's full of many things, and yet we somehow need to uh, connect all those many things in one way. We need to explain it in terms of one. Um, and in the Christian faith, uh, really since uh, Ambrose, the, the theologian Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan, uh, there has been a vision of seeing this Greek concept of harmony as having its culmination in the people of God. In the, and in Augustine, that becomes translated into the city of God, which he, in, in his book, The City of God, compares to the harmony of discordant melodies. You get all these melodies together, um, and the, the result miraculously it turns out to be a kind of consonance. You also see in, in the history of Western literature, uh, all over the place, uh, poets and uh, novelists will draw on this musical concept of counterpoint and the musical concept of harmony in various different ways, sometimes to illustrate marriage, uh, the relationship between a husband and a wife, uh, to illustrate um, uh, civil society and how different uh, factions can be brought together into one. Um, and uh, you notice a, a similar kind of gulf in the word harmony and what it ends up meaning around that time of 1750, around the entrance into something like enlightenment or romanticism in the history of ideas, the word harmony comes to mean something different. And I can, I can illustrate that. So if you think about what I mean if I were to say um, that uh, 
the, the husband plays the melody, but the wife plays the harmony. Now, I hope that the, any wife listening to this would feel a little bit insulted by that as an analogy, uh, but what that assumes is that there's a melody here and then there's this subordinate thing that is musically less significant, it's optional. The melody is the important thing that the, the underneath the harmony is optional. Um, that is that, that newer vision of harmony as chords. Uh, but if I were, for instance, to say that um, the husband and wife, they had an argument, but they ended the conversation in harmony. Neither one of them is that harmony. What they have together is the harmony. Right? And that is the older vision of what harmony is. Uh, it is, it's not a, a separate thing in the music that's a subordinate thing. It is actually that which brings the music together into a, a harmonious whole.